the last few weeks on Wednesday nights, we've been learning about a word, hallelujah, which means praise the Lord. So every time when we come to this part in the song, I want you to sing it all, but when it comes to the word hallelujah, let's sing that word out. What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone, Christ alone. What is our only confidence that our souls to Him belong? Who holds our days within His hand? What comes apart from His command? And what will keep us to the end? The love of Christ in which we stand. Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and death. Stands above the stormy trial, who sings the waves that bring us high unto the shore, the rock of Christ. Oh, sing. stand as we sing this last stanza. Unto the grave what will we sing? Christ he lives, Christ he lives, and what reward will heaven bring? Everlasting life with him, that we will rise to the Lord, then sin and death will be destroyed, and we will feast in endless joy, when Christ is ours forevermore. Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal, oh, titled this message, The Hourglass of Salvation, and uh, that may be a little misleading. It was also on your bulletin, uh, The Hourglass, and I realize that most of the time when you see an hourglass, you think about time, and this is not a, 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 uh, a timetable that I want to share with you this morning. It's not the timetable God has placed for us to be saved. Uh, that's not the case. In fact, it's a whole different perspective of the hourglass, and you'll see that more as we get into the message. I want to use the hourglass as kind of a figure or a, uh, a way to illustrate God's plan 
through the ages of salvation. Uh, we'll be looking at primarily Romans 9. Uh, the passage, uh, the fullness of the passage is Romans 9 through 11, but I, I suspect we'll only get through halfway through chapter 10 today. Uh, I'm going to break this up into two parts. Uh, to many, these three chapters, Romans 9, 10, and 11, uh, represent chapters that support a theology that is many times referred to as election and predestination. Uh, we've been dealing with questions on Sunday nights, and one of my questions was, can you talk about predestination and election? Well, I, I didn't answer it on Sunday night. I knew I was going to be coming to it when we got to Romans, and to, particularly to this passage. But to many, these are chapters that support a, a theology that states that God has elected some to salvation and thereby predestined them to faith in Jesus Christ, and that the atoning work of Christ really was only meant for them. It's often referred to as either Calvinism or Reformed theology, and, and I want to make clear it's not my intention this morning to disparage that theology, but rather to examine the passage that is used so strongly and so often to support it. Uh, I've come to the conclusion and the conviction that truth is taught, not just supported. Uh, we all tend to look for what we want to look for when it comes to Scripture. We set our own kind of agenda and, and presuppositions, and then we look for verses that support it. Well, truth is not supported as much as it is taught, and it is taught through all of Scripture. And so context is going to be our friend this morning. I want to be sharing with you these, these chapters. We're going to look very much in detail at chapter 9, and context will help to correct any errors of misunderstanding or misinterpretation. As I read through these three chapters as a whole, and I, I did this several times in preparation for this, I find Paul's desire to see the Jews and Gentiles of Rome needing to accomplish two things. And this is what I think you'll find as we go through these chapters. Number one, Paul wants them to recognize that God has opened the door of salvation to the Gentiles. This is going to be a big part of the theme of these three chapters. And then secondly, that for Jews to return to God, who called them first to be his chosen people by the coming of Jesus Christ. But now they are rejecting Christ, and Paul is seeking to draw them to Jesus Christ. So would you pray with me this morning as we get started into the service? I need to pray for uh, clarity and that, that what I'm sharing is truth. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we just come to you this morning, and we just ask you now to open your word. Allow your spirit to speak clearly. And Father, may we become clear on the matters that we are looking at in these three chapters. And we offer this prayer to you now according to your will in your name. And for your sake we pray. Amen. If you're in Romans chapter 9, in your Bibles, I'm just going to start with it reading with you from the scriptures, and then we'll be putting some of the scriptures on the screen. But let me start with you with verse 1 and following. I want you to hear Paul's heartbeat of why he wrote these three chapters. He says in the very first verse of chapter 1, I tell the truth in Christ, I am not lying. He wants them to be absolutely clear of the purpose for which he is writing this. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. I have a great sorrow and a continual grief in my heart. I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. Paul is bearing his soul with these chapters. He's saying, I see in, the, in the, my own people a rejection of the Christ whom I have been preaching. And so it is for this purpose that I want to share this particular passage with you. Look on at verse 4. He's talking about those who are Israelites, to whom pro pertain the adoption. And, and I put that word bold up here on the screen because we're going to come back to that word. You're going to hear that word again. Here it's applying to Israel. It's applying to, the, to, to those of Israel. They have pertain, those that uh, are Israelites who pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises. These are the things, he says, these are what God's people, the Jews, have received over the years. He goes on to say in verse 5, of whom are the fathers, and he goes back to Abraham. 
and from whom, and this is important, from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came. I'm going to give you a little spoiler here. We're going to be looking at the hourglass as though this is the way God has designed it, that at the beginning he had a multitude of people whom was the nation of Israel that came through Abraham that found their way after the exiles into a remnant, into one person, because through these people came Christ. That's what he's saying. Who is over all and eternally blessed of God. Amen. It's with this desire in mind that Paul begins to remind the Jews in this chapter, particularly chapter 9, first of all, how God chose them. And we're going to be looking at the word chosen. We're going to be looking at the word elect. We're going to be looking at the word predestination. I I want you to be clear in your minds when you leave this morning what Paul is speaking of when he says these things. He's going to talk about how God chose them, how they then later rejected him, but he ended up saving a remnant after the exiles. And then he's going to conclude by talking about how he kept his promise to use them by bringing his son into the world through them. And then how he opens the door of his salvation to all nations. And that's where the hourglass comes back out again. So let's look at this. Beginning at verse 6 now, in Romans chapter 9, he says, But it is not the word of God, but it is not that the word of God has taken no effect. He makes the statement, they are, not all of, they are not all Israel who are of Israel. What does he mean by that? He says, the nation Israel is composed of people, but individually not all of them are children of faith, as was introduced by Abraham. He's saying they are all Israel, but they're not all of Israel, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. Because, And he then quotes from Genesis, in Isaac, your seed shall be called. What does it mean to be called? He's going to be talking about this. He's he's already talked about it some in chapter 8. We'll go back to that in in a moment. But in what way was Israel the chosen people? Our eyes are all on Israel today. We're seeing it again today. We're seeing this this great uh, attack upon these people. And, And we still refer to them as the chosen people And I want you to see what they were chosen for. Chosen in Scripture speaks in three different ways. It speaks of Israel as a nation. It speaks of the individual, Jesus, as the chosen one. And it speaks of the church, those who will see the end of the age. So look with me, and we're going to take just a moment to kind of uh, get our foundation set forth here. We go back to the Old Testament, to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Here's where we see that the chosen refers to Israel as a people. It says in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 6 and 8, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. Uh, Make note of some of these expressions that he's using in Deuteronomy to talk about Israel. He calls them the chosen people. He calls them a special treasure. He also calls them holy And so as a result, we see that they have these characteristics. You're going to see the same characteristics that Peter just uses to describe the church. They're described as a holy nation. They're described as a treasure, a peculiar people. And they're described as chosen. In verse 8 of Deuteronomy 7, he says, Because the Lord loves you, and because he would keep the oath which he swore to you. He had said earlier in verse 7, he says, He didn't choose you because you were more in number than any other people. You were the least of peoples. But because the Lord loves you, because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers. What oath is he talking about? And the oath was to bless the nations through the seed of Abraham. I take you back to Genesis, and this is where it's first stated, Genesis chapter 12. When when God first makes his covenant with Abraham, here's how he puts it. He says, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And notice this, in you, talking to Abraham, God says, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Paul will come along later when he writes the church at Galatia, and he will explain what, what he's saying here. He says, and the scriptures, foreseeing that God would justify, notice Paul's argument, the Gentiles, that he would come to the place where he would begin to save Gentiles. 
He preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying what we just said in Genesis 12, 3, In you all the nations shall be blessed. When he said that to Abraham, he wasn't saying that, Abraham, I'm going to bless all the nations because of you. He said, in you. You say, well, you're getting picky. Not as picky as Paul gets. Go back to Genesis in chapter 26, and he, he makes it very clear when he says, in you, what he's talking about. In Genesis 26, 4, he says, I'll make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I'll give you to your descendants all these lands. And in your seed... That's what he's saying to Abraham. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. It isn't Abraham that's going to bless all the nations of the world. It isn't that they're children of Abraham. They're going to have to be the children of the seed of Abraham. Well, who is he talking about? Well, again, (laughs) Paul's pretty clear on this too. In Galatians 3.16, he says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds, I'm still reading from Galatians, he does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, and then he identifies it, who is Christ. So that the chosen is not just referring to the nation of Israel, it comes down to refer to the person of Jesus Christ as well. Isaiah makes this clear. In Isaiah 49, verse 7, Thus says the Lord, The Redeemer of Israel. Who's he talking about? He's talking about Jesus, the Son of God. The Redeemer of Israel. Their Holy One. Not the holy people. They they were a holy nation. But this one, this Redeemer, He's a holy one. To Him whom man despises. To Him... And we just heard from Isaiah 53 how he was despised and rejected of men. He whom man despises, to whom the nations abhor. He goes on to say in the rest of verse 7, To the servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes also shall worship, because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel. He, God, has chosen you with a capital Y, Jesus the Son of God. Not only was Israel the chosen ones, Jesus is the chosen one. The New Testament bears this out as He's the chosen one. In Matthew 12, 18, it says, Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom I have, my soul is well pleased, I put my spirit upon Him. He will declare justice to who? The Gentiles. Luke 23, 35, and the people stood looking on. These were those that were gathered there at his crucifixion. And in their attempting to ridicule him, they were identifying who he was. The people stood looking on him, but even the rulers and them sneered, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ, if he is the chosen one of God. Not only was Israel the chosen nation, but Jesus was the chosen one. And Peter makes it definitive. In his letter, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, he says, Coming to him, speaking of Jesus, as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. There is no doubt that when you use the term chosen, you're not only talking about Israel, you're talking about Jesus. And then after Jesus comes, a new covenant is made, and that includes all the nations, the Gentiles. Jews and Gentiles together, they become the chosen in Christ, and we see that hourglass grow large again. It started out large as a, as a multitude of the descendants of Abraham, but then it came down to one, which was Jesus, and now it's growing large again. Again, in 1 Peter chapter 2, here's what Peter says to the church. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. And just like Israel, you, the church, are a holy nation. His own, and this this translation says special people. Uh, King James says peculiar people. It means a treasured people. 
that you may proclaim the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Just as Israel was a chosen nation, the church is a chosen generation. The question I have to ask this morning is, chosen for what? See, so many times this whole discussion says, talks about chosen election as though the only outcome of being chosen is for salvation. But it's a far more purposeful thing than that. You and I have been, as the church, chosen for a purpose. Let you look at it another way with me. The other term that's used in this discussion is the elect. Now, Paul, by the way, doesn't use chosen in Romans, except to talk about Gaius, who was a chosen uh, uh, servant of God. He never uses the term chosen in Romans. He does use the term elect, and only, but only one time here in chapter 9. And when we see the elect, again, our mind goes to one thing, elect. Well, those were those who were elected before the foundation of the world. Those are the ones that God wants to be saved. Let's look at it and see what it says in Scripture. Once again, emphasis is given to who and when they are elected, rather than why they are the elect. And I will take you back to the Scriptures to show that the term elect can also refer to Israel, the remnant Christ and the redeemed at that time. The elect could refer to all, all of those three areas that chosen referred to. And the best way I can describe that is with the hourglass. Let me put one on the board. Let me show you what I'm talking. The hourglass represents the elect. And in the beginning, God gave a promise to Abraham, said, I'll make you a great nation, a multitude. They won't be able, it'll be like the sand of the sea, the stars of the heaven. Abraham began with eventually 12 tribes through Jacob that would multiply tremendously while in Egypt and then return to the promised land where they would begin to reject God's judges, God's kings, God's prophets, God's law. They would reject everything until they, as a nation, were brought into captivity. But at the beginning, they are the elect. Isaiah says, for, my, for Jacob, <clears throat> my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect. That's where they're called his elect. Isaiah 45, 4, for Jacob, my servant, for Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect, I have even called you by your name. I've named you, though you've not known me. And then as we go back to the hourglass, what I want you to see is that it comes back down and begins to narrow, and there is formed... Of those who have gone into exile, just a remnant. But even the remnant is referred to as the elect. In Isaiah 46, verse 3, it says, Listen to me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel. He'll go on later in chapter 65 and say, I will bring you forth, I will bring forth descendants from Jacob. And he's talking about the elect. He says, I'll bring them forth from Judah, an heir of my mountains. And he calls them my elect. My elect shall inherit it. My servant shall dwell there. And he's talking about the remnant. And it is from this remnant, and we'll go back to the hourglass, it is from this remnant that there were two from the tribe of Judah, Mary and Joseph. And these two from the tribe of Judah had one child of God. They had other children, but they had one of God. And his name was Jesus. And he becomes that very small part to which is now referred to as the elect. Isaiah called him that in Isaiah 42.1. He said, Behold, my servant whom I uphold. And notice how just as in, in Isaiah he referred to Jesus as the chosen one, now he is my elect one. In whom my soul delights, I've put my spirit upon him. I will bring, he will bring forth justice to who? The Gentiles. And then after his coming, we see the hourglass begin to grow from the day of Pentecost forward so that the church becomes a multitude now that will someday stand before God. And in Isaiah chapter 65, verses 17 through 18, Behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth. The former shall not be remembered to come to mind, 
but be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. Behold, he's speaking of the future. I create Jerusalem as rejoicing and her people a joy. And later in that same Isaiah 65, he says in verse 22, And they shall not build another inhabit. Uh, they shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For in the days of a tree, speaking of longevity, so shall the days of my people. And he calls them my elect. Shall long enjoy the work of their hands. These are the inhabitants of the New Jerusalem. We've seen the hourglass go from a, a nation to one to another nation, a generation. And that's the church. So, folks, hear me clear. We are elected in Him because He's the elected one. We are chosen in Him because He's the chosen one. He didn't elect us as much as he elected him and everybody who appears in him. When you stand before God in heaven and he asks, why should I let you into my kingdom? There's only one answer you could possibly give. Father, I come in Jesus Christ. I come in your son. But I ask the question again. So we are elect and so we are chosen. But elected for what? And chosen for what? Most think it's for salvation, but it's far more purposeful than that. It brings us to the subject of predestination. Once again, more emphasis is given by this group as to who they are than why they are. Some use Romans 9.13 to say that God loves some people and hates others. What's Romans 9.13 say? As it is written, Jacob I have loved and Esau I have hated. And I've read that so many times, but I've read it through the lenses of those who try to make it say that he hates, loves some and hates others, and that's not what it's saying. Do you know why I know that? Because this is a quote from the Old Testament, as it is written. Where was it written? I'll tell you where it was written. The book of Malachi. The last prophet of the Old Testament makes this statement, Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated. It wasn't made about individuals. It was made about nations. It was not Esau as a man and Jacob as a man. It was Esau as a nation, which had become not only the Edomites, but all these, a lot of the Canaanites that Israel had to go into to clear out the land. There was that problem that... that, that there was, a, there was those who sought God and those who did not see God. Israel was those of Jacob. What God hated is what the nation of Esau had come to be. The nations of the brothers, not the brothers. Folks, hear me clear. God doesn't hate some people and love others. Don't let somebody convince you of that. That's a gross misrepresentation of election and predestination. This leads us to the greatest misunderstanding in Christian faith that he has selected some to be saved and some not to be saved. Well, then what does predestination mean? Well, let's go back to the word predestination. I'll tell you what it means. It deals with purpose rather than people. You say, well, how can you say that? Is that just your opinion? There are only four times in the New Testament where the word predestinate appears. Twice is in Romans, and we've just looked at them in, uh, a couple weeks ago in Romans chapter 8 because that's where they appear. We'll look at them here in just a second. And then they appear twice in the book of Ephesians in, verse, in chapter 1. In Romans 8, 29, it says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined, what? To be conformed to the image of his Son. We talked about this two weeks ago. The purpose of predestination was to once again restore the intentional will of God, which was let us make man in our image. He made us to make us into the image of God. He saved us to make us into the image of God, and that is the purpose for our salvation. He predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son, that we might be the firstborn among that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That was the intentional will of God. If you were here two weeks ago, we talked about the intentional will of God, the permissive will of God, and the ultimate will of God. Well, what is the permissive will of God? The permissive will of God allowed man to make the choice to either obey that, that will or that desire or not. And as we all know through, through life and through Scripture, man chose not to, and he sinned. And after sin, Jesus came, the seed of Abraham, 
to provide the restoration of man through his own death and resurrection. Everything we sang about this morning, everything about the cross, that's at the very heart of the middle of the hourglass. Everything passes through Jesus. And when it did, God allowed that same permissive will that allowed him to, to choose not to obey him, that same permissive will gives us the choice today to, impre- to embrace the grace of Jesus Christ through repentance and faith. And just as I shared two weeks ago, yes, you have that choice. Yes, you have that choice. The ultimate will of God is that those who are now in Christ, the chosen, the elected one, that they will then fulfill God's intentional will as they reign with Him in heaven. And it goes not just from from being conformed to His image here on earth to represent God while here on earth. It takes us all the way into heaven. Look at Romans 8.30. Whom He predestined, these He also called. Whom He called, He justified. Whom He justified, He glorified. And that's where we end up. Reigning with Him in heaven. Because that's the plan of God. That was the purpose of your salvation. He didn't purpose who would get saved. He purposed what the saved people would become. And that's predestination. He also talks about predestination in Ephesians. He uses it to speak of our purpose in becoming children of God. And guess how we do that? In the same way that God received Israel to become His children, His chosen, is the same way He receives us to become His children and His chosen. As sons by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will. And then in verse 11 of Ephesians 1, Paul finally shares how we are predestined to obtain an inheritance according to the purpose. Look what it says. To Him also we have obtained an inheritance. That's our eternity with God in heaven. Being predestined what? According to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will. In other words, folks, when you hear the word predestination, don't think of people. Think of purpose. Just as I've changed your perception of the hourglass this morning, don't think of time. Think of how God has used that design to bring salvation now to bless the nations of the world. When you go back to Romans 9, you see in verse 4, this is the verse we looked at earlier, who are Israelites to whom pertain the adoption. Just as he received them, he now receives us. Now Paul begins to argue that God is just. He's righteous when he chooses to include Gentiles. The rest of this discussion in chapter 9 is not about how he's righteous and just by choosing one man to be saved while not choosing another. He's talking to Jews about the fact that his intention and his plan and his will is to bring the Gentiles to be a blessing to all the nations. That's why we looked at all of those things up to this point. Look at verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Is God not just because he's now saving Gentiles? You remember when we had the sermon, God forbid? This is the same expression, meganoito. Certainly not. That's not what he's saying at all. Paul always likes to use this when he's giving a rhetorical question, which is obviously not the case. God is not unrighteous by choosing to save Gentiles. What he is, is merciful. And that's what the rest of this passage looks at. Look at verse 15. He says to Moses, I'll have mercy on whomever I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. In Sunday school this morning, we said this was one of the reasons for the miracles. It showed us who Jesus was like. He had mercy. He had compassion. And then he uses the example of Pharaoh to illustrate his mercy upon Israel, who although they were in bondage and being held by by Pharaoh, he says... So then it is not of him who wills, verse 16, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows what? Partiality? No. Mercy. The emphasis is upon the mercy that he's showing to Israel when they were in bondage. For the scripture says to the Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. People say, well, see, he hardened Pharaoh. 
I challenge you to go back and read the story and find out how many times before God hardened the heart of Pharaoh that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And what you will discover is that Pharaoh hardened his heart and God just reinforced it so that he could demonstrate his mighty power. And that's what he says, that my name be declared in all the earth. Therefore, but the focus, verse 18, is upon the mercy. He has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills, he hardens, yes. But the emphasis is on mercy. Don't focus on Pharaoh. Focus on those who he is now showing mercy. Then it was Israel to bring them out of Egypt. Now it's the Gentiles. And that is Paul's point. Verse 23, that he may make it known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he's prepared beforehand for glory. Even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Why do I keep coming back to the Gentiles? Because, folks, you're Gentiles. We're all Gentiles. If we're not Jewish in, in, by birth, we're Gentiles. You wouldn't be sitting here today if God didn't open up the hourglass through Jesus Christ to include us in his salvation. And that's why we're here. He then begins to talk about, uh, makes his point from quoting Hosea. Look at verse 25. He says also to, in Hosea, I will call them my people. Who? The nations. Who were not my people. And her beloved, who was not my beloved. It shall come to pass, verse 26, in the place where it is said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. And that's you and I. And then he uses Isaiah to show his mercy upon the remnant. In Isaiah 20, 10, 22 is the quote that he's, he's about to give. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved. His conclusion is that the Gentiles attain salvation by faith. While Israel, they're still looking to be saved by the law. This is Paul's whole contention, not just here in Rome, but also with the Galatians. This is because Jesus became a stumbling block to them. They thought they had to get to God through the law. He said, no, it's by faith in his son, Jesus Christ. And he became a stumbling block. They are currently rejecting the gospel by not seeking it by faith in Jesus. What shall we say then, verse 30, that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. But Israel, verse 31, pursuing the law of righteousness has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why is that? He says in verse 32, because they did not seek it by faith. But as it were written, or as it were, by the works of the law. That's what they're still trying to do. And they stumbled at the stumbling stone. And Jesus is that stumbling stone. That's what he says in verse 33. He quotes him again. Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of fence, and whoever believes on him will he not put to shame. Remember that statement, not put to shame, because he's about to use it again. What Paul was doing is appealing to fellow Jews to understand how they were chosen for a purpose to bring the Messiah into the world. When he was here, he was the chosen one. Now, through his church, his people have been chosen to not only reflect his image, but to share his gospel. In other words, Israel brought Christ into the world. We bring the world to Jesus. That ends chapter 9. And that's the biggest thing about election that you'll find. When we get into chapter 10, and I've got just a couple minutes, so let me just do this because this is, this is common ground. You know that this is the most evangelistic part of it. But I, I, I need you to see from chapter 10, verse 1, why he's writing us this. Brethren, Paul says again, my heart's desire... The burning in my heart, the transparency you're hearing in my words, and my prayer is for Israel that it may be saved. He not only wants them to understand that the Gentiles are going to be saved, but he wants to bring them back to God through Jesus Christ. In verses 2 through 7, he, he, he talks about how they have tried to do it through the law, but it's just not going to work. So he then, let me just jump to verse 8. 
He quotes Deuteronomy 30, 14. It says, what does it say? Well, Deuteronomy 30, 14 says, the word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. And then he unpacks, what does that mean? He says in parentheses, that is, it's the word of faith which we preach. And then those two verses that we so often use to share how we can become children of God by the turning from our sins and the, re, and the placing of our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, he says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, I want to just pause right there for just a second and tell you, here's a, here's a thing. <clears throat> a lot of people have taken this to say, if you just say this prayer, if you just say these words, you will be saved. That's not what this is even saying. It says, if you confess with your mouth. What does confess mean? It means, I agree with God that Jesus is Lord. That's how we come to Jesus Christ. I am agreeing with God that Jesus is Lord. We don't just pray to receive him as Savior, folks. We pray to receive him as Lord and he becomes our Savior. If you will agree with God with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And believe, put all your faith and hope and trust in your heart that God not only raised him from the dead, it's not just saying, oh, I believe the stories. Saying, well, if God raised him from the dead, he'll raise me from the dead too. To eternal life. Then, he says, you will be saved. And he explains it in verse 10, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness. That's what Abraham did. He believed God, and God reckoned it unto him as righteousness. And with the mouth, your confession is made unto salvation. You're telling the world, I believe in Jesus Christ. Because the promise of verse 11 is for the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be, and what, remember what we read earlier, put to shame. You will not be put to shame. Verse 12, when this is usually shared usually sounds like an add-on, but it's not. Look what it says. Paul is bringing this whole discussion, and now he's brought it into the realm of salvation, and he says there is no distinction between Jew and Greek or Gentile. That's what Greek means. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon his name. My daughter had a great deal of confusion wondering if not, whether or not she was of the elect. I shared this with the church one Sunday night. It brought her great heartache. She was confused, but she was in a bad place with other things as well. And it wasn't until she came to understand that if she had called upon the name of the Lord, the Bible says she would be saved and she could put all of her faith and trust in that. Have you ever called upon the name of the Lord? Have you ever said, God, I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. And I know that Jesus died because of that sin. And, and, and I agree with you that this needs to come out of my life. And I want to give my life to you unreservedly, unconditionally, just as you've given your son to me, unconditionally. And today I want to call upon your name. And I trust your word. It says when I do that, you will save me. I think that's a good place to close for today. You see, next week we'll look at why not all Jews and not all Gentiles are going to heaven. He's going to talk about branches. And there's, there's folks who want to confuse that, but we'll straighten that out next week. But for today, I want to ask you, have you ever called upon the name of the Lord? Because... If you haven't, you need to. Would you bow your hearts with me?